So we're going to jump into today's lesson with linearity, intercepts, and symmetry. So we're going to begin by completing the warm-up. Pause the camera at this time and try to um, go ahead and state the domain and the range of each function. Hopefully you paused, hopefully you stated, and hopefully you remember that the domain is all of the x values and the range is all of my y values. And hopefully you remember that we um, write these in order from least to greatest when we are writing them out. So if we are going to look at the answers, our domain is negative 7, 3, 4 and 6, it's all of the x values. Once again, they put them in order from least to greatest, and then they did the y values, again, in order from least to greatest, negative 6, negative 5, negative 4, and 7. And then it said to write a rule for each function. So the rule here is y is equal to negative x. Let's try it out and see if this rule works. If I plug in 3, 3 times a negative 1, or negative 3 becomes negative 3. I get out, if I plug in a positive 3 in place of x, I get out a negative 3. Same thing with 4, I get out a negative 4. Plug in a 6, I get out a negative 6. I plug in a 7, I have negative 7. So that works, our function rule works. So you can go ahead and check each of the following, the rest of these, y equals 3x, y equals 1 half, and that doesn't seem to make sense to me. If I plug in a 2, I don't get it. There should be an x there. y equals 1 half times x because half of 2 is 1. Half of 8 is 4. Half of negative 6 is negative 3. So on number 3, make sure that you put y is equal to 1 half x. Okay, and check in the others. Um, 8 take away 1 is 7. 0 take away 1 is negative 1. 4 take away 1 is 3. So it works for each of those. So what are we talking about when we say linearity, intercepts, and symmetry? That's the goal of this lesson is to be able to um, identify linear and nonlinear functions, to identify the intercept and the intercepts of function and to identify whether graphs of functions possess line or point symmetry and determine if they're either um, even, odd, or neither. So we'll do part of this in one video and part of this in another video, but that's the overarching goals there is to um, define each of those things and to answer those questions. It says most people take out a loan when they buy a new or used car. Equal monthly payments are made until the cost of a car is paid in full. If the auto loan has 0% interest, the loan balance over time is represented by a linear graph like the blue one shown. But for nearly all loans, the lender will charge interest. In the beginning of the loan, more of the monthly payment is being applied to interest than to the principal. As the balance of the loan decreases over time, the interest accrued each month decreases. This forms a nonlinear graph like the green line shown. And I look at this all the time with um, my home loan. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not a millionaire and I didn't get to go pay cash for my home. I borrowed money from the bank and probably at some point each in each one of your lives you will borrow money to make a big purchase, whether it be for a car or a home or something along those lines, you will borrow money. And you realize at first, you're like, man, I paid we'll say $300 a month towards my payment, but they only took off a hundred. I still owe all of that money. Plus now all they took off was a hundred and I paid 300. Well, what's happening is you're paying on the interest. When you borrow money from the bank, you are accruing interest. If you're paying $300 and it only went down by 100, you are getting robbed. <laughs> that is really high interest rate. But that's what happens because you have this huge amount. So at the beginning, that interest, that loan that you take out for that large sum of money, um, they're charging you a lot of interest on that. If you've paid it down and towards the end of that loan, you know, you don't owe as much money. So the interest on that each month isn't that much because you don't now, you haven't borrowed as much money. You've paid a bunch back. So that is why it's a nonlinear graph, this green one. It doesn't happen in a straight line. It starts going down more rapidly once you 
pay more amount because the interest rate then isn't it's still the same rate but you're not having to pay as much interest because you do not owe as much money I hope I explained that clearly all right so we don't really we're not gonna look at the standards um, if you are interested it is FIF4 and FIF5 um, in the common core standards but I am going to show you the vocabulary. This is the, all of these definitions are right there in your workbook, but I would make sure I get these written down. I would highlight them, something along those lines, because um, I do expect you to know the vocabulary. So we're going to get started in the lesson, and hopefully I will define them as we explore this lesson. Okay, so symmetry and functions. You can use the sketch to explore the symmetry of graphs and functions. Use the arrow buttons in the top right hand corner of the sketch to move between the four graphs. For each function, there is a vertical line drawn through some point on the graph of the function. So this is step one. Press show reflection to see point a, a reflection of, or I'm sorry, to see point B, a reflection of point A in the vertical line. Drag A along the function to see whether the reflection is also on the function, and then complete the row of the table below the sketch. So we are going to reflect, Ooh, we got two graphs here. Let's go back to the first one. We can drag this A across. We can show the reflection of B. Hmm, when will the reflection be on the graph? Right there, it looks like. Keep on going. We can show the rotation. Let's move A around. The rotation is. 180 degree rotation so we see that no matter where the rotation is it's or where a is the rotation remains on the line of 180 degrees let's look at the next one a we move a around look at what happens with the reflection this time the reflection across the line y the vertical line up and down here y it's always going to be on the graph how about the rotation though Ooh, now my rotation is only on at one point. Let's look at the next one. What do you think is going to happen with my reflection? It's going to be on there part of the time. Sometimes, but not very often. How about the rotation? My rotation is always on there nice all right so we can fill in the blanks is point B always on the function nope oh wait that was f of x let me go back was point B always on there the correct answer is no was point C always on my function yes all right so looking at g of x is a or is B always on the function? Yep, this is my function. The blue line is my function. B is always on there. Is C always on the function? Clearly we can see that's a no because it's not on there right now, so it can't always be on there. Look at our next one. Was B always on my function? We know that was a no. It was sometimes, but not always. But C, yes, C was always on there. So no and yes. And then my next one, once again, show reflection, show rotation. That's a big fat no for both of them. They are not both always on there. So no and no. Let's see how smart we are. Woohoo! We are smart. We can do it. Okay, we're going to go on to the next example, or to the next learn. This has some definitions here. In a linear function, no variable is raised to a power other than 1. If there's an exponent higher than 1, 
then it is not linear. Linear is in the form of y equals x plus 2, y equals x plus 3, or f of x equals mx plus b, where we know m is our slope from algebra 1 and b is the y-intercept, and they must be real numbers. Okay, a linear equation can be written in the form of ax plus by equals c, and the graph of a linear function is always a straight line. A function that is not linear is called a nonlinear function. That goes without saying, right? Um, it includes points that do not lie on a straight line. Maybe they lie on a curve, but they don't lie on a straight line. A nonlinear function cannot be written in the form f of x equals mx plus b, because if it's written in that form, it's linear. A parabola, that's that U-shaped graph, that's the graph of a quadratic function, and it is a type of nonlinear function. So we've got linear written in the form of y equals mx plus b and cannot, if it's nonlinear, it cannot be written in that form. So here's some linear functions. Here's some nonlinear function. Notice they have exponents higher than or different than 1. g of x has an exponent of 2. y has an exponent of 3. The square root is the same as having an exponent of 1 half. This x being in the denominator has an exponent of a negative 1. So these all have exponents different than 1. All of these have an exponent of an understood 1. Therefore, they're linear. These are not. And some graphs. Nonlinear functions have curves. They're not straight. A circle would be a nonlinear function. This is a discrete linear function because all the points, if I were to connect them, lie on a line. Even though it's discrete, it is linear because they're all in order. And this is a continuous linear function. This is a discrete nonlinear function. They're not all in a line. And this is a discrete, I mean a continuous nonlinear function. All right, so jumping into example one at the bottom of page 13 in your workbook. We're going to work through this together. Part A, we're determining if it's linear or nonlinear. So 6x minus 5 all divided by 3. Well, we could simplify this out to see. But what I do is I like to look at the variable. This variable has an understood 1. It's not in the denominator. So it's not, we don't have to change it. So I know that this is linear because my, um, that my variable term, the x, does not have an exponent other than 1. We could go ahead and simplify this, take the original equation and distribute that denominator of 3, simplify, and then it makes it a little bit easier to see that it's written in the form mx plus b, where my b is negative 5 thirds. Okay, looking at letter b. I see that 3, so my first thought is, no, it's not linear. It's going to be a nonlinear function. But we have to double check because if there was like an x squared um, over here, or I mean an x cubed over here, 3x cubed that I could subtract from both sides and simplify, then maybe it would go away, and then I'm not going to have a nonlinear function. It would then be linear. But we can see that even if I were to divide everything by 5 to get y by itself, that does not get rid of my x cubed. No matter what, I'm not getting rid of that x cubed. So it is a nonlinear function. Okay, looking at this, I see that's in the denominator because the x is in the bottom of the problem. We know that it has a negative exponent. Therefore, the exponent's not 1, so it is nonlinear. Okay, looking at this one. This is a linear function. I can see this. I can rearrange it so that it's in the form of y equals mx plus b, but it is still going to be a nonlinear function. Let me pause this for a second. All right, sorry about that. Um, where was I? So this one can be rewritten in the form y equals mx plus b by using, um, subtracting 3x from each side and dividing everything by 2 to get y all by itself. Therefore, it is a linear function. Be sure that you remember the square root is the same as having all of that raised to the 1 half power. So that is not a linear function. 
in this little study tip here, to write any linear equation in function form, solve the equation for y, and replace the variable y with f of x. So that's writing it in function form. That y and f of x mean the same thing. Okay, example two, identifying linear functions by looking at a graph. To me, this is a little bit easier. Of course, we look at this and we think, oh, it's linear because this is a straight line and this part's a straight line. But it is nonlinear because even though this half of it's a straight line and this part's a straight line, it's not one continuous straight line. So this would be nonlinear. Look at that one more time. There's no straight line that will contain all of the points, points A, B, and C, so it is nonlinear. This one, there is a straight line that can be added in, so this is a linear function. Even though it's discrete, it is still linear because all of those points could lie on the same line. Identify the linear function by looking at the table. To me, the easiest thing to do is, is to look and see if my rate of change is constant and or to graph it. And if, if we graph it, we can very, very quickly see that those points are all going to lie in a straight line. Therefore, it is going to be um, continuous. So we can drag this over are not continuous, but linear. It's discrete because it's a bunch of random points, but it is linear because all of those points lie on a line. So in this function, it is linear. Okay, something to watch out for. Changing the domain. If Michaela works a six week and earns 238, her earnings will no longer be modeled by a linear function. So changing the domain to include more weeks produces a point that is not on the same line. Therefore, it would not be a linear function if we were to change that. All right, and go ahead and take a minute to complete the lesson check in your workbook. This is, let's see here, where is this lesson check? It is at the bottom of page 15. There is a lesson check. Okay, and we're going to go back and pick up example three at the bottom of page 14. But before we do that, we're going to look at intercepts and graphs of functions. So what is an intercept? An intercept is where the line crosses the y-axis. That's the y-intercept. An x-intercept is where the line crosses the x-axis. Kind of self-explanatory, I think. So this would be an x-intercept. This would be a y-intercept. All right, so, sorry, had another <laughs> interruption. So let's see, where were we? X-intercept of would be here, and this would be my Y-intercept here on this graph. Looking at another graph, the, or looking at it verbally, the X-intercept is the X-coordinate of a point where the graph intercepts the X-axis. I already explained that, where it intersects the Y-axis. And the x-intercept is always going to have a corresponding y-value of 0, just like the y-intercept is going to have a corresponding x-value of 0. Thinking about where they are, of course, if it's on my y-axis, my x-value is going to be 0. If it's on my x-axis, the y-value is going to be 0. All right, and that is going to conclude. Um, I thought there was an example 3 here. Did I do that example? I don't know how it jumped from, maybe I already did example three and I don't know what I'm talking about. Huh. I'm, I'm so scattered. This is crazy because I keep getting interrupted. I'm so sorry, guys. You're going to have to bear with me on this process. I'm going to have to make videos at home or something because clearly I cannot make them in my classroom. But we will figure this out. You're just going to have to be really patient with me and my awful videos. But I love you guys. Just bear with me.